Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm so grateful that you came, you left your house, put like she said, one foot after the other. Thank you so much for coming and allow me to welcome our congregation, our friends and family online, whoever's watching us out there. This is Ponte Ilim Church. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in and you have tuned in just at the time of the word we're going to go into the scripture and share the word together and i hope that you have your bible at home i hope that here in the congregation as well you have your own bible whether it's a phone you go on the bible app or you you go old school just uh, flipping the pages but we are going to go in the scripture together i wonder how your week was how you still trusting god do you know that he's got your back at all time please 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 keep looking up and trusting him because he has not forgotten about you and he has not forgotten about your need so allow me to begin the word by praying first and just committing this time in god's hand holy spirit as always i'm counting on you when we come to the word, I'm very conscious that I can do my part diligently looking into the scripture and studying and trying my best to understand what you're saying. But I'm so aware that if you just come and breathe on the word, all of a sudden things changes. It becomes a, a beautiful meal. And I just pray that you transform this word that I have prepared into a, a very, very consistent, delicious meal and also very healthy meal for each and every one of us. Spiritually speaking, I pray, Holy Spirit, bless this time as we go into the word. Make it, give it meaning to all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. So the past few months we have been going into the you know the grace series and we're we're gonna put a pause on that grace series. We're still believing that you know here at Ponte Ilim the whole year we are trusting God is a year of grace. Every month we have been going and every week we have been looking to God for a new type of grace. But today we want to mix things up a little bit. We want to go back to uh, studying the scripture. We want to take a, a few weeks in uh, looking at the book of James. If that's all right with you, I want to invite you where you are at home, whether you're part of this family and you're not able to come for whatever reason. And I'm aware that some people work on Sunday. So wherever you are, or you just one of those friends of ours who watch us uh, online, I want to invite you to go on this journey that we're looking at the book of James. Every now and then it's good to just um, open a, a, a passage of scripture and a, a few chapter one after the other and just going to God and asking him what are you saying to me that's relevant to me today I can apply that so we, we try to do that to balance things so we're going to look at the book of James and the good news about James is that it's only five chapters when you take a big book, like which we tried uh, in the past to take a big book, it can take months and months because it's got, you know, 20 chapters or something. But when it's a book like James, it's just five chapters. The good news I'm talking about is that there is no pressure to impress anyone to say, well, that throughout the week I, I read, you know, seven chapters I've done every day. And there's no that kind of pressure. You can just take one verse at a time and... You meditate on it as long as you want. You have the whole week. You just stay on one chapter. And you're actually looking deeply into that chapter and praying, asking the Holy Spirit. It's amazing how when you come to the Word of God with a willingness in your heart to see something new, it always brings up something you did not see maybe uh, five years ago that you heard someone preach on the book of James on that particular chapter. Maybe they, they did not highlight something all of a sudden it will jump out because at that particular time, on that particular day, the Holy Spirit wanted you to pay attention to that. And since you were in a position to be willing to receive the word of God as he came and as he was speaking to you, you will see something fresh. And that's what I want to invite you. Please take a moment in the week. 
let's stay on the chapter one and we'll see as many verses that we're going to cover today in uh, the message today and just unpacking it and seeing it in light of other scripture always like when it's a bible study uh, i call it mini bible study always because it's not as deep as you know a lecturer will do really take back to the greek words and you know every now and then if necessary my throwing that kind of study but i i, I stay as um, close to the spirit as possible as in what are you saying to me today but well because it's a bible study it's good if you come across a certain theme and it resonates in your head another chapter of the scripture another book of the scripture that you think oh this sounds like oh this will make sense you bring in that verse or, or that particular passage or the other scripture to make sense of what you're reading in the book of james so that's what we're going to to try to establish the book of james someone might say out there come on now like why uh, study why not just do you know a preach that ex an exhortation general thing that makes us all feel good you prepare that you got a wonderful introduction one the middle bit and then bang you finish with an amazing you know conclusion that wow everybody and everybody's happy um but i i want to bring your attention to the fact that um, when it comes to the Bible study, you really are looking for personal edification and you're looking for growth. You want to always aim for spiritual maturation at some point in your life. Check yourself, like, how have you been doing spiritually? And when it comes to the scripture, have you grown? So that's what we're looking at. When by staying longer in one particular chapter and, and one particular um, passage of the scripture, you're asking the Lord, help me grow. There's still so much. I'm still a baby. I still want to grow. I still, I still have so much to learn. I still don't know so much. So you're looking for uh, edification. You're looking for uh, encouraging word in the process always. And um, genuinely, I will hear God's voice speak to me. And in the process, I will also mature and be ready to be challenged as well. So as you turn with me to chapter 1 of James, the book of James, read it in whichever version you want. I just want to give a quick background of who is James. James happens to be uh, one of Jesus' brothers. The good thing about that is that it is Jesus' brothers, but as you read the scripture, you know that is a trusted voice in his, in itself. He's a very respected leader. He was, in fact, uh, he became a, a, a strong, well-respected leader um, in Jerusalem. He was looking after a church in, in Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection. Funny how last Sunday we celebrated, you know, Easter, Jesus' resurrection. But shortly after that, according to the scripture, James became, that's when he kind of, his leadership evolved in Jerusalem and it was you look in the book of Acts when you have time act 15 13 to 21 you'll find that he was actually considered as a, a as a voice of advice good advice wisdom words so they they uh, listened to him in the church in Jerusalem when he helped them and guide them in how to solve a situation that was becoming tricky among the believer then they will they listened to James as he gave gave good advice and throughout the whole uh, book of James you will find out that his type of advice was uh, put together as most theologians believe that uh, over time his advice is because he was that strong voice of uh, wisdom and advice he put his best some of his best teaching and that's what became the book of james they put them together and he deals with he concentrates rather with the question of daily living in god's creation which is good because we also need to know how to daily live in this amazing creation of god James 1, I read from the New International Version this morning. From verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials and many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Verse 4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Verse 6, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Verse 9. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but reach the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. Verse 11, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who persevere, verse 12, under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot tempt, cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he, uh, uh, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it give, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Verse 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly light, who does not change like shifting shadows. Let's finish on verse 18 for now, and then we'll see how far we go. Verse 18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of all he created. Praise God. So we're going to take it one verse at a time and sometimes a verse if it doesn't not quite apply to us or make sense i'm just gonna skip it but you know this is the beauty of you taking your time as well throughout the whole week staying on the same chapter maybe i skip a verse but you at home reading it the holy spirit brings you to look at that verse and so feel free to unpack it however you want but for the purpose of the short time we're given for uh, the message i will try my best to narrow it down to a few key verses in verse 1 james begin with a greeting in a writing style and uh, he says greeting but what i like about verse 1 is how for James was one of Jesus' brother. Obviously, we know that Jesus was conceived by immaculate conception through the Virgin Mary. But James is related to Jesus in the sense that he came from the same biological mother who's Mary. But he does not approach the, the word uh, of God with that kind of you do not sense a superiority as in me come on guys you know I am the one who is actually you know uh, the brother of Jesus not you as general brothers and sisters not I was the brother no he's coming in a position of a servant from verse 1 straight away and I believe from there I can learn something straight away whoever you are come in a position of a servant when it comes to the things of God and approaching God or even in relation to other people be a servant it comes already he introduces himself like forget about everything you've heard or you think you know about me I'm a servant a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ that I like very much and in verse 2 to 4, we can look at 2 to 4 already, and it's about endurance and perseverance. I don't really want to spend much time uh, talking about endurance and perseverance because a few weeks back in the Grace series, we talked about the grace for resilience. 
the pursuit of hope, in the pursuit of hope. So I want to invite you, and please, if you have not listened to that message, go on in that and uh, on the list of the grace message. Look at the the grace for resilience in pursuit of hope, and there I unpacked a little bit more of the spirit of perseverance, so you can kind of uh, kind of see an angle from there. I don't want to spend much time, but I want to pick up a word. Oftentimes, I, I stop when I see a word resonate in my spirit. I want to pick up from that verse too. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whether you face trials or may of many kinds. I mean, joy and, uh, and, uh, and trials, it's like you shouldn't put them together. What I pick up from that verse is that joy, consider pure joy when you're going through things you know joy is very important and in that moment i want to stop for a moment and say god help me to uh, remain with the spirit of joy in all circumstances because the enemy is always after your joy if we can suck out of the spirit of joy out of you, you have no desire to get out of bed. You have no desire to even go to work. You have no desire to go to church. You have no desire to do anything. <coughs> joy is a powerful weapon when it comes to the things of the spirit. So the first thing the enemy is after, usually, regardless of what circumstances you're going, whether government is doing great and they're making laws that please you, whether they, you know, things are going well, the fuel prices is up or down, whatever is going on around you, if you can keep the spirit of joy, you find a way to survive and be an overcomer as a believer. So I look at that verse. I can forget about everything else. I pick up the joy word, consider it pure joy, joy. And I stop and begin to pray, Lord, help me to keep the spirit of joy. In fact, it says in Nehemiah 8, 10, this is when it, we bring in another scripture to make sense of a word that leaps out of the letter to make sense of what God is saying to us at the time as we study. It says in Nehemiah 8.10, the, the C part, it says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That tells me straight away that if I can keep the spirit of joy in my life, no matter what happens, someone offended you, uh, something happened, you know, happy about uh, your life circumstances, whatever it is, if the spirit of joy is still in my life, I have strength, yeah. I have courage, yeah. I can do anything. The devil is not going to take me down because joy is still there. Consider it pure joy. So Lord, help us, help us to keep that spirit of joy. Are you going through any trials? Still in that passage in verses two to four, you look at the word trial. You know, for me, I have a principle. If I'm going through a trial of any kind, I might as well benefit from that trial. So I wanna encourage you today, if you are going through any trial of any kind, at least benefit from that trial in what way by allowing God to help you grow because within that trialing season you find yourself if you are willing there's either there's two ways you can go either you're grumbling and complaining during the trialing season or you say God allow me to go through this season and I want to benefit from it and you grow you begin to go. That's what's called in the in the spirit world is called maturation. The spirit of maturation. So I'm gonna choose that if I'm gonna go through any kind of trial, at least I wanna go through that road of maturation. Lord, what you wanna do with my life to mature to the point where you want me to get to that place, then help me. And I'm willing. And you stop complaining. It's one way or the other. And I, I choose the mature process. I wanna, I wanna grow in the in the midst of this nonsense, in the midst of this thing that I don't understand or I do not like. It's painful. It's painful. It hurts. But at least I wanna benefit from it. Friend, are you hurting? In one way or another, benefit from your pain. It is possible by choosing the spirit of maturation. 
Let's go to James verse 5. Verse 5 from 5 to 8. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who give generously to all without finding fault. You know, you can just stop there and say, if any of you lacks wisdom, replace wisdom with anything. If any of you lacks money, if any of you lacks courage, replace wisdom with any of your need. It will still make sense when you look at the generous God. The following phrase says, you should ask God who gives generously. Isn't it good and comforting to know, oh, when I come to the Father in prayer, he's generous. He's generous. And usually we are praying, say, God, are you hearing this prayer? I've been asking this for a long time, but we're forgetting that he's generous. You come to him knowing already, he can give it to me if he wants to. So if I haven't got it yet, there is a reason, but I need to, come to, to see that picture of a generous God who wants me to have the best things, who wants me to, to, to have healing. If you've been asking for healing for your brother, for your sister, whatever it is, my God is generous. I'm lacking something. I'm coming to a God who is generous. That's a good picture James is painting for us. If you lack anything, ask this generous God. Don't be shy to ask him. What is it that you're lacking today? Ask the generous God. And there's so much that can be taught or they can be learned from this passage. But we don't want to emphasize on faith because I believe when you go on further in other chapter, James will give more advice on faith. He will talk more about expanding more on, on faith. So we will dig a bit further down uh, in terms of faith. So we leave faith on this uh, passage for now, but we go back to the word wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, wisdom is very important. I believe it's in Proverbs 4, 7, where it says, like, get wisdom if it costs you anything, whatever it costs you, whatever the cost, I believe it says, whatever the cost, get wisdom, get understanding. Wisdom is very important. We need wisdom in our daily living. We need wisdom just to even make the basic decision. Look around you, friend, where you're at home, where you're here, whatever you're doing today, However much progress you've made is based on the decision or the consequences of the dis decision you made yesterday. That makes sense? So whatever, whatever you act today is as a result of your wisdom. The decision that you made, that's the reason why you're at where you're at today. The study you did, the person, if you're married, you decided to marry, children you had, whatever's happened, what the street you picked up to leave, it's based on your wisdom. But there's a greater wisdom than all wisdom that exists. It's the wisdom that comes from above. And we need that. We need to acknowledge that, Lord, I need wisdom so that tomorrow I don't look back with regret saying, my kind of wisdom made me reach this position, but it's not what God wanted for me. It was my wisdom. I want God's wisdom. Lord, help me to remain in a place where I constantly look to you today to, to say even the basic decision I make, whether I'm taking the A40, whatever it is, whichever road I'm taking, you know even wisdom. If the Spirit of God say go left, you say, no, I always go right. You don't know there's going to be an accident. Your wisdom will take you to a place of consequences of whatever you decided. But the wisdom of God, if you want to always be plugging to the wisdom of God, he says, James, I'm reminding you people, wisdom is very, very crucial. Where are you at today? Where are you going tomorrow? Let's begin to stop and say, God, we need wisdom. Forgive us for when we have we resisted to hear your voice and, and, uh, and follow your instruction. Forgive us for when we lacked the wisdom that came from you. We refuse to acknowledge it. And this is why we're where we are today. But Lord, we pray that tomorrow is coming and the day of tomorrow is coming. We want to be able to say, look at where the wisdom of God has led us as a church, as a person. 
as a family, wherever you are, in your work, they say, Lord, give me wisdom, even to how to deal with difficult people at work, what to say and not regret what I said before. Wisdom is key. It says, get wisdom in Proverbs, get understanding. Even whatever it costs you, you need to get wisdom. So let's begin to ask God. Holy Spirit is the master of wisdom, the Holy Spirit. And I like to stop and start, stop and start. I have no shame in doing that. When I'm doing a Bible study, I stop and start. So I read and I stop. If I feel pulled to do a prayer, I do a prayer. And I want to invite you to do the same and just ask Holy Spirit. You are the giver of all wisdom. I ask for wisdom in every decision that I'm making. I ask for wisdom even in my choice of prayer, what I pray, the people I pray for, how I do my daily life. I ask for wisdom, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. James 1 verse 12, it says, Blessed is the one who persevere under trial because having stood the test that that person will receive the crown of life. No, it's mentioned in the book of Revelation. I would like you to turn to Revelation. Let's bring in Revelation to see that crown of life, which is mentioned there. I see the crown of life is mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's mentioned that it's a crown that is given to the persecuted church. And I want you to, to also stop, please, look at it. This could be the Holy Spirit speaking to us for a phrase, a simple phrase. When we look, it just says that blessed is the one who perseveres. Uh, it says blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. You know, over here, we might be talking about, I'm under trial, people don't like me at work, or I'm fighting with my sister, or this and the other, you calling that trial. And then the James says they will receive, when they stood the test, they will receive the crown of life. But then I want to bring your attention to the fact that this same crown of life is promised to the persecuted church, the church, um, the, the church in Smith. Mina. No, when the revelation came, the word of God came to the revelation came to James to um, the seven churches, and then one of those seven churches was Smyrna. If you turn to Revelation two, just to make sense of the crown of life, you will begin to feel like, wow, you consider your trial, but are you in the persecuted church? You begin to maybe develop a little sense of like, I'm grateful for where I am. This is when you think, I've heard someone say before, it could have been worse. You think you're going through the worst situation ever. But out there, there's someone who's 10 times, 1,000 times worse than you. So you begin to be grateful, even in that trial season. You go back the previous verses again, choose maturity. I might as well grow in this period. And while you're at it, the crown of life, Revelation uh, 2, let's just read. Uh, Revelation 2, he said, to the angel, from verse 8, sorry, I didn't say, Revelation 2, 8 to 11, to the angels of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and who came to life again. I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who slay, they, uh, who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your crowns, your victor's crown. That's the crown of life. You read it in a different version, you will hear crown of life. I will give you the crown of life. It's basically Jesus promising it to the persecuted church. You know, I read that passage all of a sudden, my heart warmed up saying, can I forget my problem for a minute and pray for the persecuted brothers and sisters? Is the Spirit of God reminding me your trial? Is God reminding you and me saying that have you suffered to the point of death? 
in Hebrews, I believe is in, in Hebrews 12, around Hebrews 12, 4, it, it talks about that if you have not suffered to the point of death. So if your trial has not led you to the point where you have been tried so hard, to the point where you even lost your life, my friend, it's not worse as you think it is. And so while you're at it, why not stop? And think with James here, talking about the crown of life. Let's take a minute and pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. To this very day, there are countries where they are not allowed. You know, you might wake up with the luxury. Should I go to church? Should I not go? Should I pray or should I have my breakfast first? Or should I actually watch a little telly or, then, or whatever? You taking the luxury or should I go? Some people would love to be given the opportunity to run into a building, meet, meet with other believers, sing Hosanna, raise up their voice, sing out from the top of their land, declaring Jesus is Lord and he's coming back. They will love that. They're in a country where you could be killed. It's as good as, you know, proclaiming your own death sentence if you go in the street and publicly begin to say the name Jesus or you are a Christian in this very century that we're living in. Oh, can we have a heart to pray for them and forget for a minute our own trials. Whatever you call my trials, I'm having it hard at work. You have no idea. Really, would you like to swap with the person who is in a persecuted country or a, or a church where they're persecuting the believers? Lord, let's take a minute. We pray for our brothers and our sisters who are hurting we pray for them. You know exactly which country, where they are, oh Father. At this very time, as we read in the book of James, we remember you have promised to give them the crown of life. But in the meantime, they are really suffering. Oh God, give them strength, we pray. Give them strength, oh God. Give them strength to sustain all the, the hardship they're going through for the sake of the gospel. And those who have seen their loved one being beheaded because they said they profess their love for you. Oh, this morning, our heart goes out to them and we pray. Let them feel the comfort of your love, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray for them. Can I encourage you to do the same then this week? Please, would you take a moment and just forget your trial for a minute and remember those to whom God has promised the crown of life. Pray for those who are hurting. Wherever they are, pray for those who are in those countries, they're persecuted. You know, today, you can laugh at me or I, uh, people can laugh at you if you go right now in the street, in the town square, and you begin to say, Jesus loves you. People can laugh. But you know what? There are other churches, other countries where they are not allowed to do that. The least they can do to you is laugh, but they can never take a gun and shoot you. So pray for the persecuted, day, uh, persecuted church wherever they are. You know, our time is running, but I want to bring you to one more passage. Let's have a look how long we got. We can read, we can pick up one more verse, can't we? we just, let's just pick up one more verse and then we'll stop. Next time we'll come back to the other verses. But you do the same thing in the week. We stay on James chapter 1. Ask the Holy Spirit, speak to me. And if you feel any tug to, to your heart about any uh, anything the Lord is saying to you, like we've just done, demonstrated, it rings a bell in another chapter, bring that chapter in. Put them side by side and see how the Holy Spirit will highlight, highlight to you how to pray either for yourself or for others. It will, it will make so much sense. Just want to pick one more verse and then we'll close. I want to pick verse um, 17. James 1, 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly light, who does not change like shifting shadow. 
Isn't it good to hear our God does not change like shifting shadow. He doesn't change his mind. Like today, oh, do I feel like blessing this bunch? Oh, they have been so ungrateful. I don't want, I'm not going to bless them today. How do I? He does not change. His love remained the same yesterday, today, forever. Oh, I feel just encouraged reading that we are praying to a heavenly father, the father of the heavenly light who does not change like shifting shadow. You know the shadow, one minute it's here, the sun moves this way, one minute it's there, the sun shifts that way, one minute. God does not change. Praise. God for he remained the same yesterday, today and forever. And that phrase every good and perfect gift is from above. You know I want to encourage you as well that you have a gift. Every single one of us has a gift. Sometimes we might feel like what I have to offer is, is not much. What can I possibly do? But everybody has something to give. And so when I read that, I'm also reminded that, oh, you know what Jesus said to Pilate, didn't he? When he was being questioned, since last Sunday we, we celebrated Easter, I keep bringing last Sunday. It's just happened that I remember Jesus being questioned when you read that passage. Before he was going to be condemned to be crucified, Pilate questioned him and said, speak for yourself. Don't you know I have the power to crucify you? So basically, I have the power to kill you if I want or to free you. Jesus turns around and says that you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. So even Pilate was given the power from above at that time. Then you think you have been given something from above. I believe every single one of us has been given something, a gift from above. And then James is reminding us every good and perfect gift come from above. Look around your life. Do you have a, a bed where you sleep? Do you have a house? Do you have a, a car? Whatever you have. Do you have children? Do you have access to a, a decent job that pay your salary? Will you pay your bill? You, you have something. Everybody has been given something, even the, the, the wife that you have, it's been given from above. The blessings that you have, it came because God made it possible for you to have access to those gifts. So when I think of the gift that is given to us, it feels like, yes, I just got to enjoy my gift. I've been given this gift, I need to enjoy it. But I am reminded quickly with a Bible study, it's not always what it sounds like. With a Bible study, bring in another scripture, you will make sense. And for me, I read every good gift comes from above. It reminded me of the gift that was given, the parable Jesus gave in Matthew 25. We won't read it for the sake of time, but I invite you to read it at home and compare. I'm just going to paraphrase and summarize Matthew 25 as I'm bringing the message to a close. 14 to 34, you will read the parable of the talent depending on which version you're reading it read the the parable of the bags of gold so in that passage the master was going on a journey to one he gave five talents to the other he gave two talents and the other one he gave one talent but he was expecting them to do something with it you read the scripture it will tell you that when the master came back he, he was he gave a recompense or a uh, a reward to the one who had five and said look you gave me five and i went and and put it to work and i had five more now i have ten the other one two said look master you gave me two and i came back and i did something with the two you gave me and look i have four the one who had one came back and say shall we just really quickly say i knew that you were a hard man and i and i went and hid it uh, and so here is back your talent we haven't got much time, but um, the point I want to draw from you here is that, you know, when I was a younger Christian and I used to think, come on now, what's the big deal? Because in the passage, it's so cruel. The master said, throw him out. You know, he's not happy. But at least you got the, the talents that you got it given back to you. Should you be grateful? He looked after the one and gave it back to you. But um, you will go into any Bible concordance. You will find that 
the value of the talent, that's where we were missing at the point. What, at one talent, the monetary value was of 20 years worth of wage. And so today, if I want to put it in our day and age, a pound, let's say an average worker earned 15,000 pounds. And I'm not very good with math, but I, I timed out 15,000 on average a year. Let's say a worker earned 15,000 time 20, that gives you 300,000 pounds. I mean, if I gave you that one talent, I gave you 300,000 pounds. Surely, like Jesus said, if even if you put that into with a bank, I would have still had a significant interest on it, yet you did nothing with it. So basically, I'm looking at this, every good gift comes from above, but that gift that comes from above, God wants me to do something with the gift still. So you have something, I want to encourage you, do something with that gift. Put your gift to work. And some people usually think, I have nothing. Be it it's money, time, even your time. Put it to work. And in the time, consecrate a time for God. Whichever way you decide. And I will encourage those who have been happy, especially in the pandemic, where I'm just happy tuning from here to there, and I'm just a happy Christian. I don't need to have the pressure to be at any church or be affiliated with anything or do anything. You know, God's time. Give him a time. Do something with his given you time. Divide that time you have. Give it back to him. Whether it's your finance, it's not just your finance that is needed or your talent. If you, you know, I have this gift, I, I'm good at uh, serving this way. I, I can help people. I can, whatever is your gift, think about, look at your life and say, I have something to give back to the one who gave it. That's how I see the story. And I want to conclude with a personal example of my little brother. Um, he was sharing with me how when he moved to um, a friend, he moved to a, a new city as a foreign student in Cape Town a few years back. He was doing his master's degree. And he was like, you know, we grew up in a family where we're always going to church. We grew up in church. And for the first time, he was like, I don't feel the pressure of going to church. I'm still a believer. I'm not denying. God, but you know what? He's just been busy studying, busy hustling a part-time job between his, his uni work, doing a project, he's doing a project there, going, he's a sporty guy, he likes sport, spending time, you know, remaining fit, busy man, I'm busy, and but I'm still a Christian, I'm enjoying being a Christian just at home, not being involved in, in any church or anyone, but I'm still a believer. Until one day he was um, at a gym, he suffered uh, an injury that saw him um, taken to the hospital, put on bed rest after a surgery, and he started to be on the verge of possibly failing his, uh, his major project that he was working on because he could not attend the lectures and finish off his project with uh, the, his colleagues. And he said to me, Arlette, from that day I was on the hospital bed and I felt like um, saying to someone, are you busy? He's on the bed, hospital bed, and he said to himself from that day, I said, I'm coming out of here and I'll always save time for God. When he got discharged, he got involved in a local church, he began to serve. So despite his busy, still a busy man, busy, but now he's working, he's finished, you know, but he always said from that day he learned, the one who gave the gift that I have, he could take it away in a second if he wanted to. So I've been given gifts. I've got talents other people don't have. I need to put those talents to work. And he began to get involved. I want to encourage you, wherever you are, whichever part of the country you are, please get involved with your local church. Serve. Give out. Give back. Whatever you've been given, give something back to the one who has given it to you. Every good gift come. Every good and perfect gift come from above. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for giving us the word, the, the grace to spend time in your word and looking at it. Looking at your word with the intention of learning something new. 
Oh Lord, we pray today that you will encourage every one of us. You will encourage those who are, are at home. You will encourage them when they go throughout the week and stay in the book of James. Father, speak to every one of us individually as you want to. Whatever you're saying to us at the time, we are willing to listen. Speak to us. Open our eyes, spiritual eyes, so that we may see what you are saying, Father. Bless every one of us. Give us the courage to be obedient, to listen to your word, to, to look at your word, to learn from what you're saying, and also do as you say. Give us the courage, Father. Bless everyone, we pray. And again, we remember those who are hurting in the, the, the countries where they're persecuting Christians, Lord. We send our heart cry to you today and say, Father, remember them where they are. And we also ask for wisdom again, even as we get ready to go in a, in a new week, Father. We pray for wisdom for the week in everything that we'll do. Give us the grace to decide, make the right decision that we'll not regret, Father. To speak with grace, knowing that you are guiding us in everything that we do. Bless everyone, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.